dead inside. <laughs> but I hope you guys had a good weekend and <laughs> welcome to another week. Um, so today I'll I'll do a short recitation on um, the DIC lab and just go through exactly what we expect you guys to do um, and how you should write your report. All right. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, what was that? I should really start that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to do in the report. Okay, so at this point, everybody should have um, you know, done the DIC lab, right? And you should be um, on your way to doing the results and you know, start writing up the report and stuff, hopefully. Um, okay, so why don't I just go through um, the, whole, the whole thing, you know, what we expect you guys to write in the report. So it's a formal lab report, right? Okay, so it's a formal lab report. That means we want you guys to um, put in all of the sections that you had in the previous formal lab report portion, right? So you want an abstract and then an introduction, um, then the procedure um, results, the discussion section, um, a conclusion, um, you know, any team member collaborations, uh, and a and the references, right? So let's go through each of those. Um, so if you look at the abstract, again, I think most of you did pretty well on the abstract last time, but just a couple of uh, pointers here. So. Again, the abstract should be a summary of the paper. Okay, so you want to basically write as much as you can, uh, as much detail as you can in the abstract. Um, however, we have a strict word limit. It should be less than 500 words. All right. Um, <coughs> And really what you should do in the abstract towards the end is, which is something um, you know, some of you didn't do last time, is highlight all of your important results. Right? And you can use numbers if you want. Don't shy away from using numbers. Okay, so highlight important results. Um, okay. um, another thing is just about writing the abstract, like Try to avoid future tense. You know, don't say stuff like "we will subject the specimen to shear" or whatever. Uh, mostly these days, at least, people just use the present tense. You know, so in this paper, we subject the specimen to blah blah blah, whatever. Right. Yeah. Past tense is it is acceptable, um, although. In in my experience, I've I've seen that like older papers tend to use like a passive voice past tense, you know, like in this paper, um, we subjected specimens to something, um, like all of the sort of newer the newer style of writing these days is like active voice, um, present tense. Unless <laughs> Lucas, are you okay with that? Yeah, it's kind of it's depending on who you're working with and who you're asking. It like the, yeah, exactly. The old ones are like the samples were subjected to a load of blah 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 blah. I didn't do anything. The samples just magically had this happen to them. Um, I think it's better to be using an active voice, and that is definitely the trend that things are going in. So, in this experiment, I did or we did this and this and this and this. Um, these are the results we got. That's that's all fine. Yeah, I know. You know, the past tense seems um, it seems more objective. You know, but when you use active voice, you're actually kind of taking ownership of the paper and all of your results. So, yeah, active voice, go active voice. Uh, all right, yeah, active voice, present tense. Okay, what's next? Um, introduction. Okay, so there are three or four specific things we are looking for in the introduction. First is just introduce the technique that you're using, right? What is the IC? Okay, 
um, then explain what the technique is, um, you know, what all information it can give us, you know, wh what do we get from the experiment, what physical quantities can we actually measure using DIC. Also, all of the other techniques that you've used so far, like strain gauges and the like, um, how does DIC, dif how is DIC different from those techniques? Or how is DIC, if, if so, how is DIC better than those techniques, right? And then also give um, some examples of, of, you know, DIC used in practice, right? And you can consult literature about um, all of those things. Okay, and then finally, um, this is again a point in which um, second uh, percentage of you lost points. Uh, state your objectives in the introduction. State what you want to do in this experiment. However, the introduction is not a good place for you to present results at. Right, you've already done that or a little bit of that in the abstract. And you're going to do that later on in the results section and the discussion section. Right? Don't present results in the introduction. OK. Next is the procedure. Any questions so far? Yes. For objectives, could we put not failing this class? <laughs> um, let's just say we won't grade that. Okay. Um, for the. Thank you, but that's the objective of three things. Yes. Yeah. Three assignment. Um, okay, for the procedure, again, please don't copy from the handout. So if you copy from the handout and change every sentence just a little bit, that's the same thing as copying. So don't do that, please. Um, also, don't write the, uh, the procedure as instructions to somebody. Right? Uh, the purpose of writing this is basically telling people what you did, not asking them to do something. I know we write it as instructions in the lab handout, but that's because we are instructing you to do something. Right? So yes. So this is supposed to be um, this is what we did. We did this. Or you could also write in this, you know, we subject the specimens to something. We do this. We do that. You could you could use uh, um, active voice in this also. Yeah. So yeah, that's a great question. You don't. You definitely don't have to go into like a whole lot of specifics, right? Because um, so the purpose of this, you know, if you were writing a real paper, is putting it out into the world so that other people can see what you try to replicate what you've done and learn something from what you've done, right? So it should have enough detail that it's uh, replicable. People should be able to replicate what you've done. But you also have to understand that everybody does things a little differently, right? So you definitely wouldn't write something like, you know, I. Um, I went to my Windows computer and I started the Blue Hill application, or you know, you wouldn't give that kind of detail, right? So some detail in in this case, just kind of use your judgment, right? But again, it should be um, replicable. Somebody should be able to do exactly what you did. Does that adequately answer your question? Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so yeah, don't copy from handout. That's super important. Don't write as instructions.
Okay. <clears throat> so next, let's do the results. <coughs> yes. I mean, a paragraph is a paragraph is better, definitely. Okay, so for the results, um, we've given you four points here. So I'll go over all of those uh, that are in the ha uh, lab handout. Right. Okay. So the first is the applied stress strain um, response. Right. So this is basically just a plot, um, and this is something that you guys got from the data, right? So this looks something like this. Okay, but this is your extension, all your strain. This is your load, all your stress, right? And make sure to put a little um, uh, a legend here where this is, let's say, hole, this is no hole, something like that. Okay, so that's your first result. Then, okay, so the second one is. is the DIC results, right? For So for um, points two and three, what we'd like you to do is, uh, again, point two is all of the stuff that we measured from DIC. Point three is uh, the predicted um, stuff from MATLAB, right? So what you can do here is, uh, so for each, each, um, each strain, let's say if this is, you know, we're looking at the actual strain, so EXX, um, you can put three figures here. The first one is DIC no hole specimen. Right, then the second could be DIC with hole. And then the third one is predicted. Okay, so then this could be one figure, right? And then you'd have six such figures, right? Because because you want you want um, all of the strains at um, two points on your uh, load extension curve, one less than five percent strain and one more than five percent strain, right? So basically, if you go back to your plot number one, just figure out where five percent strain is here. Okay, so let's say that's 5% strain. Pick one point to the left of that. Pick one point to the right of that. Right, figure out what the extensions at both of those points are. Figure out what the loads at both of those points are for each specimen. Right? Um, and then you can use the extensions. Um, uh, you know, you can look at the extension, then you can go to the video. Um, approximately just uh, make sure that's how much your um, specimen is extending by in the video take a snapshot um, for each strain right okay um, so then let's go over to the computer and look at the MATLAB script yes for the one greater than five percent do we want to keep it relatively close to five um, I I'd say don't go towards the edges. Don't go towards the you know maximum right. strain. Like maybe less than twenty percent okay. would be fine. So somewhere not terribly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not towards like the end of the test. Okay, computer. Oh, um. So there's. Um, so there's one sort of thing which I um, which I forgot to mention in lab. It actually hadn't struck me 
um, but I realized over the weekend. Um, so when you're plotting stuff in MATLAB, you'd need, uh, and also when you're figuring out what the extension or strain is, uh, you know, the percentage applied strain is. Mm -hmm. So applied strain is delta x over L, right? So what is L in this case? Sorry, what? Yeah, the, the original length, but I mean, what is the original length here? So the original length, you'll need to measure this from the, um, from the video, right? Because it's basically, it's the effective length. It's the effective length that's um, under stress, right? So, so technically, it's the, it's the length that's between the jaws, right? So initially, when we were doing the experiment, I thought you could just directly measure this. Right, but then I realized that the jaws actually extend. The point at which the jaws the jaws impact the specimen is actually like a little bit more than what you can see in the video. Right, so you you have to add some length to it, and that that length is forty mm. Right, so L here is uh, measured from video. Yes, is that better? measured from video plus 40 mm so i went back and i measured what the like extension was mm -hmm. you know the stuff that you couldn't see in the video it's 20 mm on each side okay so depending on that your applied strains would change yes wait is it 40 mils on top and on the bottom no 40 40 millimeters total okay. so 20 mm on both top and bottom Okay, yeah, so let's look at the MATLAB script now. Okay, so that's the MATLAB script that we uploaded. Um, again, there are like three or four different parts to it. In the first one, like right here, you're just defining all of the sample properties, right? Then you're, these are basically uh, parameters for the plot, right? So your um, the spatial re resolution is like a thousand by a thousand. So that's how many points you're considering, right? In the next section, you're calculating the tangential and radial stresses. Right after that, in the next section, you're converting those to Cartesian coordinates. Then finally, you're converting um, the stress to strain. Right, and then in this last section, you're just plotting the results. Um, again, feel free to change this whatever way you want. If you you know you do not have to exactly do this. If you want your plots to be you know slightly different, feel free to change it. Do whatever you want, um, as long as you know it's it's clear, um, and we can understand whatever you've done. Um, okay, so here's another correction. Um, your Young's modulus is, uh, this is my mistake. I wrote in the lab handout that it should be 16.5 um, MPA. It's actually six, 6 MPA. So please make a note of that. I will also send out um, an announcement later. Okay, then next, the Poisson's ratio is correct. Um, then the applied stress here should just be um, whatever load you're putting divided by the cross-sectional area of the specimen, right? Um, then you've got W and you've got H. Uh, please keep in mind that um, in the script, W and H are, are swapped, right? So you're um, in the video, your y-axis is the length, in this case, the x-axis is the length, right? So your w and h values, your width and height values are swapped, right? Which is why in the width column, I have put in the height of the specimen, which is for the one for the data that I was looking at, 130 mm, 
and the height is actually the width which is 25 mm right okay so once you've put in the width and the height you can go and put the same things in the applied stress again so load divided by um, width times height Oh, I'm sorry, this should be the cross-sectional area. This is this is uh, not correct. It should be the width times the the thickness. Right, so that's that's correct. That's 2.3 mm. Okay, let's just change that to 2.3 mm. Okay, and then um, again, you've got the whole radius also. Right, uh, this is approximately 4.3 mm. Again, you can make your own measurement from the video if you want. And if you just hit run, takes a couple of seconds, but there you go. So you get three figures here. You've got um, the longitudinal strain, axial, transverse, and um, shear. Okay, and then you can just, you know, right click and save these images um, use them in your lab handout um, this is also a great way of just double checking your sample calculations right because if you just click anywhere here it actually gives you what the numbers are right so just a nice way to double check your calculations also okay any questions all right, let's go back to the dark cam. Then um, the next thing that we want you guys to plot is again the strain gauges, the virtual strain gauges that we put. Um, and again, there's a correction here also. I mentioned this in most sections, but I think I forgot to mention mention this in like a couple of sections. Um, the numbers for the um, strain gauges are also swapped. Numbers two and three, right? So one is still the one at the top. Two is this guy right here. Um, three is up there in the far field, and four is um, down below in the far field on the right. Okay. So yeah, just make a note of that. Um, again, for the for for these results, we just want you to sort of populate this table, right? Just do it exactly like this. That should be fine. Um, four strain gauges, exx from the strain gauge that we measured, then the theoretical value, the error. Um, same thing for the EYY, um, then all of this repeated for the small strain and finite strain. Okay, um, and then another thing about the results section is don't just put um, figures and plots on there. Please also explain a little bit, you know, about the results. Some of you just sort of in the results section just put, um, you know, either raw data or uh, just the plots and tables but you should intersperse the um, like all of your figures and tables with some text and definitely don't put raw data in there okay so results tables and figures interspersed with text and no raw data Okay, so that's what we want you to do with the results section. Then let's look at the discussion. Okay, so the discussion, the first point is um, 
again, what's the difference between the applied stress strain response for the specimen with the hole, without the hole? Uh, is this what you'd expect? Again, pretty self-explanatory, right? Just uh, talk about the, the plot that we made earlier and say whether you'd expect it to be like that. Um, if it is or if it isn't, you know, why is it that way? Um, so the second point is, do the strains developed in the specimen without a hole match those pretty theory, right? Um, so again, you can talk about both the you know, less than 5% strain and greater than 5% strain here. You could possibly put in another table if you want, right? Um, and then this is also a good place to talk about um, the error bounds of, uh, of this experiment, right? So if, if let's say this is, you know, you've got like, this is your specimen without the hole from DIC and you've got these contours like that, right? And here you've got um, a bar, right, with the levels basically. And this is, I don't know if this is 25, this is 30, right? Then this basically gives you an idea of the noise, right? Um, let's say you're doing this for small strains, so you kind of expect this with a predicted theory as well. Right. Um, that also it can tell you. It can give you some idea about a systemic error. Right. Let's say your range here is 25 to 30, and let's say your theory predicts 20. Right. So your error here, if you take the average, is what is this? 27.5. So your error would be 27. Point, um, or your sorry, your measured value would be 27.5 plus minus 2.5. Right. So. This difference here represents a, a systemic error, right? That's why it's off by 7.5. And this represents the noise, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's something you can talk about. You can quantify your errors in this section. Um, okay, then number three um, is Again, compare the strains developed in the specimens with and without the hole. Do the far field strains match? If not, you know, why might they be different? Okay, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory here. Um, again, the location of the minimum and maximum strains for the specimen with the hole, right? Just go to, the, go to your video. Uh, the screenshots look at um, where the maximum and minimum strains are. Compare them with theory also. Give the theoretical values and try to figure out why they're different. If they're not different, you know, great. Um, if they are different, why are they different? Um, again, 0 0.5 is somewhat similar to 0.4. Uh, so you should do this with both um, the specimen with the hole and the specimen without the hole, right? Um, Again, you'd expect um, you'd expect the strains to be pretty different at um, you know a higher applied strain. So, you know, we briefly talked about this stuff in um, in lab about why they might be different, about certain assumptions that the theory is making. Um, so, you know, write all of that in. For, um, again, for the specimen with the hole, do the strains qualitatively match the theoretical um, strain contour plot? So in general, do they look the same? Um, we don't want you to do a you know a numerical analysis of this, just like you know qualitatively, not quantitatively. We don't want you to come up with a, a mean absolute percentage error or, or anything like that. Just in words, just say if you think they're similar or not. And again, um, if not, why? Um, then for the next point is. Um, Again, how much error is there between the uh, theoretical strain and virtual strain gauges? Uh, again, uh, you look at um, basically just the table that we drew earlier. Where did that go? Uh, it's this point is basically just an explanation for this table right here. Right? Just look at these errors and try to figure out why they're different. Okay, and then finally, what are the sources of error present in this experiment? You know, what's the dominant source of error? Again, talked about this um, during the lab, so just 
write that stuff down. Um, okay, um, so that's the discussion, and then again, you'd want the references in there, right? Some of you didn't put a reference last time, so you know, uh, we had to take some points off for that, but please put references. Um, then next is, or oh, wait, sorry, before the reference, you have conclusions. Conclusions or summary. Um, again, one thing I noticed in the last report was that um, several students treated a conclusion as just a sort of, you know, kind of like the last paragraph of your discussion section. So it's almost like you were further discussing stuff in the conclusion section, which is not something you should be doing. Right? The conclusion section is again just a summary of the of the entire thing. So you know it's best to start off with something like in this this experiment or in this paper we did you know whatever describe what you did um, you know briefly very briefly describe your methods and then you know describe your results and you know just a very short summary of the discussion section. Right, so that's what your conclusion conclusion section should be. Okay, and then finally we have the appendix. Um, so, I don't think you should put raw data in the appendix this time. Well, partly because you don't really have any raw data or you have very little raw data. Instead, you should show sample calculations. For, for the strain gauge analysis. Okay, so again, coming back to this table, um, again, just basically show a sample analysis of how you got these, uh, or some of these. Again, you don't know to, you don't need to show calculations for every specimen, but but just show uh, calculations for a couple of specimens. Um, yeah, and then please mem please mention um, team member contributions if you did not collaborate with anyone, just mention that. Say you didn't collaborate with anyone. Uh, yeah, and I think that's it. Do you guys have any questions? Okay, so let me just outline the corrections once more. So I think we have three corrections. So E is 6.0 MPA. Right, then string gauge two and three are swapped, and the length is the measured length from the video plus forty mm. Alright. Cool. So I guess uh, yeah. I guess that's the recitation. Any any questions at all? Yeah. Any comments you might have about anything? I mean, has, it, has anyone started going through the lab yet? Nope. <laughs> There's like a couple people shifting their head, yes. Okay. I would advise getting started early. <coughs> Hopefully we gave you enough guidance in the lab manual and with the recitation to get through everything, but I foresee that there will be some problems inevitably. So the faster you come up to those, the easier it will be to get around them. Um, yeah, I have an office hour today uh, that you want to come to and ask questions. I office have office hours tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. yeah. So please, um, yeah. Stop by office hours, um, you know, email if you can't understand anything <coughs> or if you need help with anything. Um, yeah. We just need a shoulder to cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. well, we're here for you. <laughs> <laughs>